Thank you. Thank you very much, Director Ken. Uh, Mr. Sheehy. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> I'm uh, Barbara Sheehy, and I was the CCS County Administrator in Contra Costa County from 2002 until uh, February of this year. And um, in terms of an overview of the services and care that CCS provides, um, we arrange and coordinate and then authorize payment uh, for the specialty medical care for our clients. And again, the, the children are uh, ranging in age from birth to 21. Um, and of, as you know, we serve a, a broad range of, of medical conditions. Um, and in order to uh, be enrolled in the program, the children need to meet financial, residential, and, and medical eligibility requirements. The clients are seen at uh, Department of Healthcare Service uh, facilities or uh, certified facilities, special care centers, seen by CCS approved providers so that uh, we're assuring that children are being <laughs> seen by um, excellent uh, board certified providers and comprehensive multidisciplinary pediatric teams. The two primary components of the program, uh, the first <coughs> is our administrative case management program. And this is where our physicians, nurses, eligibility workers, clerical staff, and in some counties, uh, social workers, nutritionists, and others um, determine eligibility for the program. We work with the families and the providers to uh, coordinate care and the providers, and we've already, it's already been touched on today, it includes <clears throat> labs and hospitals and providers and durable medical equipment vendors and so forth. Um, we review the client's treatment plan to assure that the children are gonna receive care meeting CCS standards, and we also take into account family preferences and needs, so it might have to do with where the family wishes to have the care provided, or if there's a, a language capacity issue, we uh, try to manage accordingly. And then of course we authorize the payment. And we do everything in our power to make sure the children get the right care in the right place at the right time. Um, we also work with families to overcome the, the barriers. Wendy talked about that just now. It might be uh, helping to arrange transportation to make sure children can get to their appointments, it might be helping to assure family have access to meal vouchers while their child's in the hospital and the family's staying at bedside. Um, we also do uh, refer our families and caregivers to the uh, family resource centers um, so that they have the support and gain information from families who've gone through similar experiences. So we're overseeing and continually reviewing our clients' care. And um, in some counties, there are more enhanced services. In some counties, they have a, a specific transition program to help the children who are moving, or the youth who are moving into adult care. Um, in Contra Costa and Alameda County, we arranged to have a nurse actually on site at Children's Hospital <clears throat> Oakland to really improve the face-to-face um, -face, uh, engagement with families and also to help problem solve issues with providers and so forth. The second overlapping component <clears throat> of the CCS program is the medical therapy program uh, where we provide direct outpatient rehabilitation services at public schools throughout the community. Um, so CCS occupational and physical therapists provide evidence-based therapy to our clients as part of the child's prescribed um, treatment plan and to improve their, their function and long-term potential. And it's there that oftentimes uh, we will work with the child and family with their equipment, which could be a stander, it could be a wheelchair, where we train them in proper use of the equipment. And in addition, we have um, 
physicians who specialize in um, working with children with physical disabilities who come and hold clinics where the physician along with the family, client, and our therapists evaluate the child, uh, look at their progress, and plan for the upcoming six to 12 months of uh, care. In terms of um, current challenges and barriers, um, there, there are three I would say that stand out uh, for me. Um, one is what you started with and everyone has spoken about, and that is that um, children with special needs are straddling these various entities of primary care, specialty medical care, developmental disability system, special education, mental health, and that we do, we, we are actually um, arranged in silos. Um, and it results in fragmented care. And it's, it's children and families who, who suffer as a result. Um, it's an overwhelming burden on families. Um, and so I, I am looking forward to California really considering a more um, child and family-centered approach, a whole child model to assess all the child's needs, the, the planning of care and Im implementing and coordinating of services. Um, the second big challenge is the uh, poor reimbursement rates for providers. Um, a, as you know, CCS providers are paid at the Medi-Cal rate, um, and then physicians generally have a 39% bump, what, what we call a bump. It still <clears throat> remains extremely low reimbursement, and we've, we've seen the loss of some local and, and statewide uh, providers, and, and that trend, of <clears throat> course, is a worry in terms of access to, to care for kids. And, and the third um, challenge is, with the discussion of moving CCS into managed care and the potential of really dismantling the pediatric system of care in California, um, we, you know, there, there's a concern that the, the outstanding care that kids actually have access to through CCS may be diminished, may, may change. And that, of course, not only is a threat to those children and in the CCS program, but really to all kids, all families in California. So that's a great concern. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Schnuck, welcome. Move this over here so it's a little better. So thank you so much for the opportunity to, to comment. I'm going to, uh, been thinking about uh, speakers have gone before, and, and it's very interesting. I, I've called this a tangled web. It's sort of like a William Wordsworth, a tangled web we weave. And if you think of a child, a three-year-old with autism who has some compulsive behaviors and now has type 1 diabetes, I counted there are at least 12 entities that are trying to coordinate the care for that child. So I'm here representing the Children's Specialty Care Coalition uh, as the president, but I also come as a general pediatrician who practiced in small town in South Carolina for three years, and I've also been running a, a patient-centered medical home for kids with heart transplants at Loma Linda. I'm the chair of pediatrics at Loma Linda, so recruiting and retraining qualified faculty is key to a lot of what I do. And then just recently was named the chief medical officer of the Children's Hospital. So it's this kind of a sense of, of the challenge that, that we have. So for those who don't know the coalition, we were founded in 1998 to address the growing crisis in availability of pediatrics, especially physicians, and this was commented on just previously. <clears throat> and we're representing now about 2,000 subspecialty physicians in the, in the state of California and are really at the forefront of providing care to children and families with special health care needs. And then we work as part of the multidisciplinary care teams. And I know you're familiar with the CCS program and it's been described. Um, <clears throat> we were asked to give an overview of services and care. I think that's been done pretty well. I'm going to speak to this now because I represent the coalition mostly from the subspecialist point of view. And the pediatric specialty care is typically provided at regional tertiary care hospitals and outpatient centers to ensure sufficient volume of patients. For instance, you can't just really have one pediatric nephrologist. You have to have several of them so that you don't burn them out. And so that care is typically concentrated at places that have a sufficient volume. <clears throat> And obviously for that, the CCS program is an integral part of that. And especially the standards that have been set 
that define what is a qualified physician to provide that care and also was a qualified center. So our center was just uh, reviewed three weeks ago. Bob Diamond and his team was there. And they went through in detail about how we provide that care, provide a lot of collaborative and supportive information and, uh, and advice and guidance. And I think we're going to be better for that whole process. <clears throat> We work closely with the CCS County administrators and nurses to ensure children get the right care at the right time, at the right place, <clears throat> and someday with the right uh, reimbursement. Um, and the, I'm sorry, <laughs> it, it works. The, the, you know, however we put together the payment mechanisms, it, 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 it works, but it's a very complicated process. And if you could create a system that's more rational, I would be thrilled. There are a number of challenges and barriers impacting the care. So one of them is the lack of real-time data that can be used to measure health outcomes and could be used to drive system-wide improvement. I think of CPQCC as a model for how that should and, and can be done statewide. And also to demonstrate the program effectiveness. We all talk about CCS as being a great system, and it is. Uh, and I think we could, we could do better if we had a, a more rational way of assessing data. Um, the mom who talked previously about the, the transition, that is a huge issue. The magic number of 21 when they age out of CCS, uh, that, that is definitely a challenge for our patients. Having uh, access to pediatric subspecialists, again, it gets into how we support um, the physicians and uh, the fact that I'm recruiting from a nationwide pool of subspecialists, not just within California. And so there's got to be some sort of parity across state line to allow us to do that. Mental health coordination access is a big challenge. The system of providing uh, ideal communication between generalists and the subspecialists, we all uh, need to work on that. Um, if CCS patients are enrolled in a whole child model uh, within the managed care, um, how that gets uh, assessed, whether those children stay unique or if they're just rolled into the general population, whether there's a tiering system for how they are paid for based on complexity, that will be a, um, an interesting challenge for us to work through. Um, um, supporting and creating medical homes is a real challenge, and I'm not sure that we've got that sorted out for kids who have complex needs. Um, it's not the same to have a kid um, come into your practice as a general pediatrician where you're trying to see four to six kids an hour in order to maintain the revenue to pay your rent and et cetera. So there's got to be a different payment mechanism for how that's done, but also standards that hold people um, to a certain standard of care. Um, so the CCS program in particular and treatment of children with special needs in the state is is actually working relatively well. And when you, and the mom talking about this earlier is, you know, most of them are happy with the system. So whatever we do, <clears throat> and I'm a firm believer in a whole child model, it, the details of how that should be done is, is key. But the transition needs to be managed in a way that <clears throat> doesn't break <clears throat> what's working okay, working well. It could be done better. So um, we talked about ways that it could be improved. Um, and we're really looking forward to and continue working collaboratively with Director Kent and every other providers. But let's proceed cautiously in a way that allows us not to, to lose kids in the transition. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, each one of you. Uh, I have some questions I'd just like to, to, to ask. Um, so uh, actually, first of all, uh, Director Ken, I want to thank you for sharing a lot of uh, interesting data about uh, Medi-Cal and uh, CCS. And I know that uh, one of the goals, certainly, in fact, uh, we'll probably touch on this later, Dr. Chinook, one of the criticisms certainly of CCS has been, and we've heard a little bit about the separation between subspecialty and primary care. And I think when, I think when, if people, when we talk about whole child, if we are really talking about how we bring those two together, I don't think there's going to be much disagreement that there's a need to bring those together. I appreciate Dr. Chinook, you mentioned that you now lead a medical home uh, pro, uh, program, I think, for children with uh, heart issues. Heart. And, and so I guess one of the questions is that, um, uh, you know, so we're trying to move forward on, on trying to figure out how to integrate the two. Um, 
you know, what, what do you see um, as the, well, actually maybe I'll ask you, Dr. Chinook, first, because you actually run a medical home program. You said, you mentioned medical home that it wasn't, I mean, do you see a way to actually bring the two together within the CCS program? Yeah, I've thought of, of this and we're trying to decide how to do this in our in our region with our local health plan if we, and the CCS, right. even if we don't get to whole child model, how do we do this better? And I think it's gonna be uh, probably a hybrid solution based on region uh, and willingness of local general pediatricians. Right. So there's some that are willing and able with the right support, they would do it. The American Academy of Pediatrics uh, has surveyed their members and, mm -hmm. and then there's widespread support for doing that, but they all say, I need what I have. So even the medical decision making may not be that tricky, but I have a social worker and a dietitian and a case manager in my medical home that can then implement that. So I see it either as a regionalized distributed network of patient-centered medical mm -hmm. homes for kids with complex needs, that, mm -hmm. that's their home, mm -hmm. and or that group of people that I have supporting me, supporting the pediatrician in their office. So in way, one or the other probably okay. will be necessary. Yeah. yeah, I mean, certainly my experience as a pediatrician take, was actually a CCS provider who took care of a lot of those kids on the primary care end. Mm -hmm. That's been one of the challenges. A little, yeah, I like to see my subspecialty colleagues who definitely needed those extra supports, but then here I was, yep. and I mentioned before the stack of referrals, et cetera, trying to figure out with my clerk who's busy scheduling, you know, doing appointments for other patients, having people have the time to do that kind of coordination of care. Actually, North Carolina has a model where they actually give coordination care payments for patients that they're seeing. It's been very successful. They've actually shown significant savings on things like asthma and so forth, that um, where you have a coordination care payment where the primary care doctors then take that money and use that to pay for they may pool that money for a, you know social workers, nurse coordinators, et cetera, for, for that. Um, I guess one of the, uh, then, I mean, I, I don't know what the, is that something that the HCS is exploring at all or looking at? Yeah, so there's, um, there's a provision in the Affordable mm -hmm. Care Act. Mm -hmm. um, it's affectionately referred to as Section 2703. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not that I have them all memorized, but um, that particular That's section. That's the health homes uh, model that was included in the Affordable Care Act, mm -hmm. and that um, is a way for states for eight full quarters of claiming mm -hmm. that you can get a 90-10 match. So for 10 cents we put in, the federal government yeah, pays 90 cents on the dollar for care coordination. And so we have been going through a long stakeholder process on the health homes model and how it should look in California and what populations are eligible and how do you kind of create these um, homes, it, the money does not pay for services, but it pays for the coordinating of those services. And one of the populations that we have um, identified and talked about in the stakeholder process has been CCS. So um, I believe that we're um, just about due to release kind of our um, proposal out for public comment on mm -hmm. health homes, and then we would file what's known as a state plan amendment with the federal government saying, we want to um, pull this money down for this purpose and will you please approve it? So yeah, we are actively engaged in that. And then I guess the other question is, uh, Dr. Shore had talked about this idea of, and not just applying to Medi-Cal or CCS, but more broadly to children with special needs, uh, I don't know, we call it a report card or some kind of standard. Is that something that uh, the department would be willing to help support um, in terms mm -hmm. of help, help, help contribute toward? Mm -hmm. um, I say support sort of like, you know, doesn't mean money per se, but I mean in terms Excellent. of no data <laughs> and so forth. Yeah, well, you can come to us and budget yeah. for that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but in terms of at least helping provide us technical assistance and providing us data yeah. for something like that. And we have, and um, Wendy is actually on um, the, uh, it's the Medi-Cal Advisory Panel for Children's Health or MCHAP, whatever mm -hmm. the acronym mm -hmm. is. Um, one of the things that the um, that advisory group is working with us on, as well as with Dr. Lynette Scott, who's our chief medical information officer, mm -hmm. is on developing um, pediatric dashboards. And so that's mm -hmm. kind of one of the, you know, continuing evolutions of us as a department in terms of we have a lot of data, um, mm -hmm. but it's how we analyze it and share it and use it for decision making. And so we have been talking um, with a, you know, a, a set of folks about how mm -hmm. would we develop measures, because some of them are as you know, some of them are in existence and some of them aren't. Right. And so how do you make sure that the measurement is appropriate, um, mm -hmm. especially if you're gonna gauge payments or other kinds of incentives off of that. But I think we're definitely 
wanting to have um, a say in any kind of pediatric uh, dashboard or child's health card or whatever it would be referencing, yeah. Yeah, because I think, you know, you mentioned the HEDIS report, and certainly that's going to be important, but, you know, the, one of the limitations of, like, for example, HEDIS is going to look at fairly large-scale asthma, most common chronic disease right. in child, if you, if you don't count dental caries, things like that. So when you start getting to the more rare conditions, yeah. it's going to be more process measures just because the numbers aren't large enough. Absolutely. So, but uh, but yeah. I think that we can look at service quality and access mm -hmm. and so forth that uh, perhaps uh, we can talk to Packard as well about yeah. that. So Great. for... And then, uh, actually, uh, Sheehy, uh, uh, in terms of for the county, now, for CCS, the county, so where... So where does the money come from for the county part? Is that from the county? So I know we're going to dive into a little bit of realignment stuff, but uh, so what portion is coming from the county? What portion is coming from the state? And then how does that actually impact the, the services, and you, at least in your experience, the services you're able or not able to provide in your county versus, let's say, other counties that might do things a little differently? Uh, yeah, let me explain what I can, and you may want to I'll take cover it, some yeah. more. Thank okay. you. Um, uh, the majority of the kids covered by California Children's Services are uh, are in full scope Medi-Cal. They are covered by full scope Medi-Cal. So um, the other, uh, I think statewide, I think it's about 15 percent, 18 percent, um, are not covered by Medi-Cal. And again, you know, part of the complexity is some have um, some are children who are undocumented. Um, we have. Uh, families who have insurance, but it's limited, and so CCS picks up um, part of the care. Um, for those children who do not have full scope Medi-Cal, the, um, the, the funds are split 50-50, uh, state and county. That's also true for the medical therapy program, um, where there is no financial uh, eligibility requirement for the uh, medical therapy program. And so those costs are 50-50. Um, and then for those children covered by Full Scope Medi-Cal, um, we have the federal and state funds at work. Yeah. So, yes, it's almost, uh, almost fully accurate. There's uh, that little population of children that were otherwise before known as Healthy Families Kids. So mm -hmm. other, whatever we now call those children, um, counties have 17.5%. We have, a, we have a piece, and then the federal funds constitute another piece. Um, medical therapies is county funds and federal funds, so the counties provide the match for the non-federal share. Um, the state doesn't have a share. We pick up the tab on Medi-Cal, which is 50-50 split. Um, so it is, it, is, it is complicated, yes. <laughs> Actually, uh, in terms of, and where does Title V money come into this? Because we're talking about Title IX Medi-Cal. So where's Title V, our MCH grant? How does that fit into, where does that fund So CCS? the Department of Public Health um, um, has the primary responsibility for drawing down the maternal child health um, dollars. That's Title V. We get about $8 million in MCA money, and then we distribute it to the counties for help with um, care coordination stuff. But it's only... It's only eight million dollars, so it's a pretty small amount when you when you divvy it up. So just to clarify, um, so that's eight million from MCH that goes for court to counties for coordination of care. Yeah. Do you know what proportion of the cost of, of the pro coordination of care costs that eight million represents? It's like a tiny fraction, a larger fraction. I don't know. Be, I mean, the the base um, it would be in our estimate. Um, for what we spend on county admin for CCS, because we provide obviously mm -hmm. funding to the to the counties for the administration of the program, and it, and this is where it also gets complicated. Mm -hmm. Some counties are independent for CCS purposes, uh -huh. so they do the financial, the medical, and the um, the education or not educational, the clinical assessment for kids. And then some counties, we the state do the financial or medical. So it depends on each state share. I think the overall spend, and I would have to get back to you, for CCS is over $3 billion a year, and, and obviously local assistance, meaning the county funding, would be a, a much smaller piece of that right. $3 billion. Right. No, But so $8 million on that is, is a yeah. pretty small amount. But the, th it's a th but the $3 billion is the total CCS, not the coordinated care? Right, total portion, right. services. Right. And then we would break the local <clears throat> assistance down, right. but we wouldn't specify within the local assistance to the counties um, okay. how much is admin versus how much is okay. care coordination. They would then, they determine okay. that on their own. 
Okay. But I can I can certainly provide that to you okay. after. If you That'd like. be helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then I know we mainly talk about CCS, but CHDP, which mm -hmm. often does primary care. Um, um, so now is there? So CHDP is, is the county contribute to CHDP as well or not? I think the answer is no. Sorry. I think it's a state, um, state federal, federal. Okay. program. And obviously there have been a lot of changes on that um, sure. since the expansion of the ACA. And obviously there will be more changes um, starting next year when we offer full scope benefits to all children under the age of 18, regardless of documentation status. So that's a program that is the entryway. And again, um, you know, I don't want to take any of Karen's testimony away from her. That's kind of the entry into some of the EPSDT screens and services, but obviously a very important doorway that kids can pass through to get into either Medi-Cal, into CCS, into EPSDT services. Um, I neglected to mention um, a couple of the other specialty um, programs that we run in terms of the pediatric palliative care um, program that we have. We have the newborn hearing screening program. So, I mean, our department does a lot of really important and consequential work, but sometimes that CHDP door is the way in which families enter for a lot of different services. <coughs> And just um, just to touch a little bit about EPSDT, I know here in California we often think of that as, and we're going to be talking more about when we get to talk about mental health, but I know in other states that's also a mechanism for funding special, I mean, other care, because that's the that's the EPSDT, right? right. There's the, the, the treatment part, T, the T part, right, the yeah. T in there. Is are there opportunities to, uh, there for California that we're not taking advantage of or... Um, I know we'd use EPSDD in many ways very differently than other states that at least I've had, I previously was in Massachusetts and seemed like mm -hmm. it operated differently. Uh, California seems to be what unique in the way it hand, handles EPSDD. You know, I would have to, um, I would have to really um, get a little bit more grounded on the range of what we do and how we do it through EPSDT because some parts are the mental health component absolutely important. Um, some parts are the treatment, depending on where you are in the program. Um, sometimes the medical managed care plans have responsibility for EPSDT services. We have recently done some new guidance to the plans about this is what you have to do for STPT, OT. Um, and then in other cases, especially as it pertains to children under the regional centers or whatever, we will, you know, take over where other services hand off. And I mean, I, I really am struck by, you know, Wendy and others about the silos. You know, I think a lot of our goals and how we do a better job of taking care of these kids is that I don't think it's practical to say that the silos will ever be knocked down because that's just the nature of, of what we do. But it's really up to us as government entities and programs that we do the back end coordination better and so that the family and the providers to a large extent don't see that. Right. It's our job to do a better job. But um, I would have to get a lot more detail on the EPSDT to know how to answer your question, but I can I can certainly do that too. No, I appreciate it. I mean, I'd like to perhaps explore what the opportunities are. Are we missing certain opportunities because we've sort of always thought of them in certain boxes? And, uh, and I agree with you. I mean, I think we're probably never gonna, quote, get rid of the silos, but ideally what would happen is for the families that basically it all runs in the background. It's kind of like your computer, right? You don't, it doesn't have to be the interface for the user. It can run in the background. And, uh, but for the, for the families, they, it seems seamless to them. Uh, one other, just one other question for actually Ms. Sheehy. So as you're, you know, through CCS, you're doing coordination of care. I'm sure these kids go to school and they have special ed or development. How, 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 how does the CCS case manager then, do they, do, do they ever, do they, interface with, let's say, school districts around special ed. I'm sure going, these kids are going in for IEPs and so forth and develop, evaluations at developmental centers and so forth. Did, uh, can you talk maybe a touch a little bit on that? Is that something that ever happened? Or I shouldn't say ever, but you know, how, how it, yeah. It does happen and of course, ideally all, would always happen um, for those kids who are involved in each. Um, the, uh, the coordination happens um, at, a, at the greatest, um, to, to the greatest extent between the medical therapy program and special ed. So um, because our, uh, the children enrolled in that program are in fact on school site and um, we coordinate heavily with the schools, um, our therapists may go into the classrooms <clears throat> to actually um, consult with the teachers and so forth on, on a child's needs. Um, in terms of 
uh, coordination with um, our uh, medical case management part of the program and special ed. Um, that does happen, can happen, um, both at a client level or family level, and then um, some counties, um, actually with the support of the Lucille Packard Foundation for Children's Health, have developed um, collaborative uh, care coordination um, sort of bodies in the counties where we're also looking at sort of system-wide uh, coordination and just really trying to develop more relationships so that especially the, the most complex cases that we're able to get with one another and make sure that we're working you know, carefully together. Um, certainly whenever a, a family invites a CCS nurse or medical therapy um, staff member, we, it, we, we go. That's, that we are uh, set up to do that and we do that. Excellent. Excellent. Well, so ho hopefully this committee is going to be sparking a statewide conversation about the which, which hopefully will also be sparking countywide conversations about figuring out how we coordinate across these different silos as well. So I just want to thank you all very much uh, for for being here and for testifying. Sure. It's been very very helpful, and we'll be following up with with uh, some of the questions. So thank yeah. you so very much. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. very much.